So what I'm trying to say is that people are grasping for anything, particularly at the beginning of this disease state, the symptomatic state, I should say. They're grasping for anything that can change their future. Welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast. We are focused on bringing you information to help prevent from developing and improve from suffering with brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a physician and chief scientific wellness officer at Kemper Cognitive Wellness, and I'll be your guide on these sound waves. So whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have a loved one with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's, dementia, and just generally things in life's second half. If you have questions or comments, check us out on social media. To support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past. And consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show if you find these episodes valuable. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. Uh, we have another phenomenal guest today, and we are going to discuss the recently FDA accelerated approval of aducagenumab or Aduhelm, uh, Babiagen, and their partner Esai, at what some people are calling an Alzheimer's disease slowing medication. And we want to welcome into that uh, discussion Dr. Marwan Sabah. And whether he knows it or not, uh, I've been learning from him and using some of the tools he developed or co developed since my training days in geriatric medicine. Uh, Dr. Mawan Sabah is uh, the Camille and Larry Ruvo Chair for Brain Health and Director of Translational Research at the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. He is a board-certified geriatric neurologist and, and truly has dedicated his career to finding a uh, cure for Alzheimer's. Uh, Dr. Sabah is a leading investigator for many prominent national Alzheimer's prevention and treatment trials and has published more than 350 peer-reviewed articles to date. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sabah. Thank you, Dr. Brookman. Nice yeah. to uh, see you. Uh, so, you know, like Marwan, you're a, clearly uh, a leader in the field because you've been at this for a long time. Uh, and so I was very excited when I, when I was still at the Cleveland Clinic when you were recruited to lead over there. Uh, for this particular episode, I wanted to get into this new medication uh, uh, aducagumab or aduhelm, but just just to sort of for housekeeping uh, sake, can you uh, just as a matter of transparency and clarity for our listeners, can you clarify any disclosures you may have with Biogen, uh, the makers of this new newly approved drug? So uh, thank you, Nate. I want to say to this audience, uh, by full disclosure, I am an advisor to Biogen. I am an advisor to the aducanumab program, but I also want to disclose that I have relationships with many companies developing many products, including ASI, Roche, uh, Cortexime, Athera. Uh, so I'm kind of sh advising many companies on drugs. Yeah, no question. I mean, that's clearly the way that it goes. There's no question about it. That's just how, how it's done. So thank you. I just wanted to get that way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so can you, so th there's all of this, this, some people are extremely excited about aducagenumab and aduhelm and uh, and some people are, are very pessimistic about it, but can you just kind of briefly explain what this drug is in simple terms and maybe the context for it within the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, sort of what you've seen? Because this, you know, it's not like aducagumab just showed up yesterday. I and mean, this is something no. that's been, you know, 10, 11 years being studied. Yeah. So uh, the context is broad and I will try to be uh, succinct about this. Uh, you, aducanumab is actually the fifth monoclonal antibody. So a monoclonal antibody is a synthetic manufactured protein, which is designed to find amyloid. You infuse it into the blood and its sole purpose is to find amyloid and grab it and clear it out. Uh, we of course have, uh, think of a monoclonal antibody as like a natural antibody. We have antibodies, we make our own antibodies to a variety of conditions and infections, et cetera. This is a manufactured version of an antibody. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason this is important is that contextually speaking, you know, like I really said, uh, just said, this is the fifth monoclonal antibody. If you actually go back and look at earlier ones, there's been epapanuzumab, solanezumab, granazumab, uh, and others. Uh, so it's not like, you know, suddenly we have this drug or suddenly 
we have this discussion. Um, this is monoclonal antibodies have been in development since 2002, uh, so almost 20 years uh, to be exact. Uh, so there's been a, there's each successive study, each successive successive monoclonal gets a little bit better. We're more informed. We get more information about it. Okay, and then. And then, um, so, so, so you, uh, you've been um, outspoken. I, I, I should just say for our listeners, if they're not familiar, although no doubt our, our listeners are certainly familiar with this. Um, the FDA just uh, earlier uh, last week on uh, June 7th or 8th gave an accelerated approval, which essentially is like a provisional or a tacit approval uh, for a drug and that certainly this drug is not the first one, uh, to meet a need that's unmet, meaning usually it's for introducing a therapy uh, for a disease that really doesn't have another therapy. Um, so accelerated approval. So not full approval, provisional, you know, it's sort of provisionally on, you know, let's say there's be a phase four clinical trial or something like that. But um, you have been uh, an, sort of an outspoken um, proponent of this medication. Uh, you co-authored, I believe, a, a letter to the FDA early this year, I think, um, in, in a, with several others and other organizations uh, saying, hey, we, we, we are urging you to approve this. So kind of given the, the controversy surrounding this approval, can you give us what, tell us sort of what makes you optimistic about this particular monoclonal anatomy, this particular uh, drug? So there's uh, a long history here. Uh, so let me just say to you, I am a neurologist by trade, and my day job is seeing patients with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I am the guy who is giving them the diagnosis. I'm the one who's telling the people, you have a terminal brain disease. I'm the one who ha holds their hand and say, we're going to get through this. So that's an I important point that everybody should know. Dr. Marwan's not just a research guy who's saying, you know, this is what should be. He's not just pushing numbers. He's actually seeing patients. So that's, I think that's really important to point out. Yeah. And I'm seeing patients still about 50% of the time. And, wow. you know, uh, when you talk about, talk about mild cognitive impairment, which is where this drug is going to be slotted really in the earliest stages, in the early symptomatic stage before they're, before they're reaching full dementia, uh, patients are still aware. They're still functional. They're still viable, they're still independent, and they're all terrified. Every one of them is terrified because they know where this is going. This is an end. They know the outcome is not good. That, and they're, they're afraid. And, you know, I can talk all day long about exercise and diet and health care and lifestyle changes and crossword puzzles, etc. And those are good ideas and they feel good and the science is good and the data is good. But the inevitable probability is, is they will still get worse over time. Cholinesterase inhibitors, that's the denepazil, rivastigmine, denepazil, and uh, galantamine have very modest data in the mild cognitive impairment phase. They're not approved for mild cognitive impairment. There's no issue. It just doesn't work very well. So what I'm trying to say is that people are grasping for anything, particularly at the beginning of this disease state, the symptomatic state, I should say, they're grasping for anything that can change their future. And so when people kind of get into the weeds, they're like, oh, this is not an effect. There's the data is all over the map, et cetera. But I have I don't know if we want to talk about it. I can kind of opine on why this is relevant. What yeah, I can I think say is important to people uh, to this your audience is that the drug has a modest effect, a 22 percent slowing in the rate of decline. The CDR, the clinical dementia rating scale is a very, very hard instrument to move. On a, uh, uh, and just to let people know what that is, it's, it's a structured interview. So the physician is blinded to the research assignment of the drug. He does a, a interview of the patient and he does an interview of the informant and he compares his notes, of course, to his previous notes and he comes up with a score. And the score is anchored in six domains and then they render something called the sum of the boxes, it means you add all the boxes from each of those domains. Yeah, that means long, I'm just curious, how long does that interview typically take, do you know, on average? About half hour. Okay. Uh, you know, I do, I've done so many of these, I can do them about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, but a CDR, that's to say that the physician can see a clone, blinded physician 
has determined that they can see a slowing in the rate of decline. Okay. Uh, and so I will say to you, people don't understand the whole biology of amyloid. Amyloid and cognition don't correlate very well with each other. I'm and a lot, of people, a lot of people think that the effect of an aducanumab or its other drugs in the class, lecanemab, gantanerumab, donanumab, et cetera, may have an effect not because you're removing amyloid, but because you're making the brain healthier. It starts to heal itself that you no longer have these toxic proteins in your brain, that the, the synapses start to grow back, that the inflammation starts to go down, that the tau spread starts to slow, that maybe it's a secondary effect, that it's not a primary effect of removing amyloid, but it's a secondary effect of removing amyloid. Because if you actually look at the curves, you actually see that the effects don't really diverge until nine to 12 months into the, disease, uh, into the treatment. That's when you start to see the, the divergence of the curves. Uh, and Ironically, uh, you know, people are like 22% uh, is not that big. About four years ago, we were talking about another drug called solanezumab, and this was the right. Expedition 1, 2, and 3 studies. And what they, they said on the Expedition 3 study, that solanezumab uh, had an 11% effect, effect uh, on the, a different instrument called the ADAS, uh, and so it did not meet, meet did not hit on the primary endpoint, although ironically, on the secondary endpoint of the same one, the CDR, it did hit. And what the reason you need to know that is I know that Lilly had actually planned to file on a 15% delta, uh, meaning that uh, had it been just a little bigger, yeah. we would be giving solanezumab as a treatment for, for Alzheimer's disease. To, uh, so what I'm saying is 22% is not bad. Uh, I also want to say to you that if you actually look at the context, so the, the so that's issue number one. Issue number two is that people say, well, the data is split. Frankly, Nate, the problem with aducanumab is Biogen had a bunch of self-inflicted wounds in their own design, in their own reporting, in their own right. They had done. You know a, this because you were in. You mean you were a, a trial site and you were an actual investigator. You were someone who was part 100%. of this. Yeah. Oh yes. And not only that, I, I you know, I, I, I've been in this field, like I said, 25 years more. I was one of the very first people to give a monoclonal antibody, a drug called bapanusumab. I was one of the very first people in the world to give this, this class of drugs to human beings. And let me tell you, we learned a lot along the way. That first time we were doing this was 05. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So I want to tell you that, again, this is not new. This is new to this audience. Yes, right. We've been working in this field for over yeah. 15 years. We but know a lot saying, about it. You were saying the Biogen, though, has had some self-inflicted wounds. And yeah, self-inflicted wounds. So number one, and this is unfortunate because if you look at their phase one study called the PRIME study, which was published in Nature, and for this audience, if you're publishing anything in Nature, that is the biggest... Super Bowl. Part. Yeah, it's the Super <laughs> that's Bowl it. of, uh, right, of That's the right. Super Bowl of, science, uh, of papers. Uh, so they clearly showed in their phase one PRIME study that in a dose-dependent matter, the more amyloid you remove, the more slowing in the rate of decline. This was huge. It was the first time we had ever seen that before. Before that paper by Savigny in Nature, we would either remove amyloid or we'd slow decline, but we had never seen both in the same direction, in the same predicted, modeled, expected direction. You never saw them going in the same direction. Something I call directional concordance. So that is to say that the more you remove amyloid, the more you slow the rate of decline. That's called directional concordance. Uh, we had never seen that before, the prime data. So the reason that it's a self-inflicted wound is you go then into 2019, March of 2019, yeah. a Biogen announces futility, meaning that they said, their statistical people said, we're stopping the study, there's no evidence of efficacy. And we thought at that moment, done, right? Yeah. Um, Adokanamel was done. Then in October of 2019, they're like, well, hold the press, hold the phone. We're coming back. We went, bit, went ahead and did more analysis. And we showed that if you look at the highest, highest group, meaning 10 milligrams per kilogram in the eMERGE study, they showed an effect. But then they did a second study called the ENGAGE, and then they showed that it didn't have an effect. Uh, and so the people like, again, they're, the reason I'm telling you this is that the, the, a lot of this is self-inflicted. Had they done a singular design, no futility analysis, you know, don't split, don't do different titration schedules, I think they could have had a much easier time of this. So a lot of the negative press is because they, they shot themselves in the foot, not once, but over and over again. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, had it been a clean study with clean data, people would, wouldn't be looking at this and kind of shaking their head. So let me ask you, because you, I'm sure you, you so you, you, you've uh, given and seen people that you now know probably had the aducatum. I'm, I'm sure you know other physicians that have done that, uh, you know, as part of the trial, of course. Um, so what are your kind of real world observations about, right. about this? Like what, what are, what's happening in real life with real yeah, people? Real life. Uh, again, I am, as you have already said, I am one of the doctors that actually gives this. It's not, we're not opining on something that's abstract to me. I've actually been the guy in the trenches doing this work. These drugs don't make people better. I think this audience needs to be very clear and realistic about what this drug does. If in removal of amyloid, it makes people less worse over time. It does not make them better. Okay. And you have to compare that and contrast that to the approved drugs. Uh, which is, of course, is the colon estrogen inhibitors. This is the nepotil. Yeah, yeah. yeah, those are so, right. I mean, so, now I'm going to disagree with you on that. Yeah, okay. I'm going to disagree with you, Nate. One out of ten. The, the nepotil, rivastigmine, and galantamine yeah. are symptomatic drugs. Yeah. Okay. You need them to help improve your symptoms, but they don't st slow the progression. Oh, yeah. So, I, you as a primary care, your geriatrician, your primary yeah. care physician, let me let me put it in the context of let's say a patient walks in the door. For it with a fever, okay. Yes. Denepazil, rivastigmine, and and galantamine are the acetaminophen to reduce the fever. They are not treating the, the cause. antibiotic yeah. that removes the infection that causes the fever. Right. Aducanumab is closer to the antibiotic for the infection. Do you right. see my point? Yeah, yeah, but some people would say, well, why do they? You know, why do they? Why do they get the amyloid buildup? What's the reason for that, right? Like so. You so that's a very complex story. You know, amyloid starts to accumulate in the brain for 20 years before you ever have yeah. symptoms, and so uh, amyloid buildup might have to do with genetics. Uh, a phenomenon which you know well about is epigenetics, uh, uh, environment, etc. So okay. people think of Alzheimer's essentially as a problem with the clearance of amyloid, not the production of amyloid. In other words, you just don't clear it as well as you used to, and then it starts to accumulate in the brain. I got it. You know, a couple of things. So, so clearly, you said this isn't certain. You know, I think you've been clear. It's not the cure for Alzheimer's. This is it just slows it know, down. First, first pass, slowing it down uh, makes people less worse. Um, of course, there's this big controversy uh, around it. Do you, with the accelerated approval, is there a reason why? And you know, given the cost and the cost of the healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera, um, why wasn't there a restriction to use the medicine? For the for the people that they saw that improved in the study, so to speak, like people with mild cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's kind or very early Alzheimer's disease, is, is there in your yeah. in your opinion, like what what do you think? Why wasn't there sort of a restriction? Yeah, I was surprised by that, Nate. I have to say to you that I thought the the label would be quite narrow. I was surprised how broad the label is. Um, I think they basically opened the door for many more people than should get it, that will get it. Uh, uh, we know, at least from the data, that the drug, w if it's going to work, it's going to work in the mildest symptoms. So beyond a certain state of mind, it's not clear that it's going to work. Uh, I don't have a clear opinion as to why that is the okay. case. W would you, and I, you know, if you don't answer this question, you don't have to answer it. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. Would you, if somebody said, hey, I'm bringing in my wife, my wife's, you know, we're about to move her into the nursing home because she you know, she's putting on her pants backwards and, you know, she can't use a phone anymore. Uh, we heard about aducagumab. Would you prescribe it just because you, you can and, and maybe it'll right. help? So um, that's a quick, critical question. First thing I will tell you to this audience is the one thing that we have to do is that everybody has to be proven to have amyloid in their brain. Yeah, one thing thank we you learned from that. early, early previous studies of drugs is that we were giving these kinds of drugs to patients who didn't have amyloid. And that was a disaster, right? What happened? Uh, it just was a bad idea. Imagine giving a drug, a, a, a monoclonal to a patient that doesn't have amyloid in their brain. That's what we were doing. So up to a third of people were getting it. So I think that's- Can you just review with people, how, how would someone, because that's not part of the approval as far as I read it, how right. does someone, and I, 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 I dare would say that probably no responsible neurologist or prescriber would prescribe aducagumab without getting finding out if there was amyloid, although Correct. I'm sure it could happen, but how would someone know if they have amyloid buildup in their brain? Well, we have to do it by PET or CSF confirmation. 
PET is not covered by Medicare. The technology has been approved since 2013. So PET's a brain CSF, scan. Okay. Brain scan. Uh, uh, CSF testing has now become cheap and quick. Uh, and nowadays we do so it that's in the a office. lumbar puncture right. or a spinal tap. What about people with medical? It takes about five minutes nowadays to do in the office. Uh, we can send the fluid out and get a response within a week as to whether they have the uh, amyloid. I will say to you that a lot of people are in America, they want the amyloid PET approved. It's very expensive. I think that CSF might prevail. Uh, and you know, Nate, there's now a discussion about these new plasma amyloid markers. This is the C2N precipitous yeah. study. Uh, but uh, uh, that has not taken off quite as broadly as we would expect yet. Although it might in the future, I would look at plasma amyloid as probably a screening tool and not necessarily a definitive tool uh, for a diagnostic, whereas spinal fluid would be. And uh, I heard that uh, now that the spinal fluid is sent to a Mayo Clinic lab to, to get run, and they will do it, Biogen's going to pay for that analysis. Interesting. So more to come on that. Um, so I want to go back to the question of the the, the person in your office who's with his wife and she's 83 years old and she's, you know, he's, he's thinking about moving her into a, an assisted living or something like that. And he heard about this and, you know, they were able to afford a PET scan or they, she submitted herself to, you know, lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, and they saw that there's amyloid, you know, there's evidence that an amyloid uh, or it's consistent with, you know, uh, amyloid uh, and Alzheimer's. What would you say to that person? You know, like, how would that conversation look, do you think? I would say to them, and I'm sure I'm going to have this conversation, because oh, yeah. I will tell you, since I've uh, been this week, I've had out of camera conversations. So have we. Yeah. Yeah. That's the time. Um, I would say to them, look, the drug has been shown to have really significant benefit in the very mildest symptoms. We just don't know if it works in the moderate. There is a bit of risk. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say no, but I'm saying that the chances are it's going to have very limited benefit and it's just unknown. Okay. And how, how will you have the, knowing what we know now, and I read the most of the 350 page report with side effects, et cetera, um, both biogens and some of the other analyses and, um, how, you know, what, what are you comfortable saying in terms of talking through the risk? You know, when you talk about ARIA and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so ARIA is a term that we use in the field, right? So it's not a term that most people are aware of. ARIA stands for amyloid-related imaging abnormality. It's, a, it's something you see on a scan. ARIA, in most cases, is either referring to vasogenic edema or brain swelling or microhemorrhages, so these little spots that start to show up in your brain. And uh, uh, it's a good question that we would expect these... Uh, that a certain percent of people are at risk for getting the vasogenic edema or brain swelling. When we first saw it a decade and a half ago, we got really scared by it. But the, re recently, we we're like, eh, it's just a little swelling. It's no big deal. Most times it's, it's asymptomatic. It's clinically asymptomatic. And we just manage it by stopping a, a dose or two. Uh, and it doesn't cause anything that's problematic. So most of the time, the complications related to uh, to aducanumab are not of concern with this vasogenic edema or microhemorrhages. Uh, but uh, when you first time you see it, I remember very clearly the first time we saw it, it was it was scary. But now it's like, eh, you know, kind of just work through it. Is it do people? I mean, so you see it on image. This is something that's picked up on MRI. Do, do people usually do they feel? There's a, is there sort of a correlation between the, you know, they're not seeing well on the left side or, you know, like they're right. more dizzy yeah. or their balance is impacted? Right. So, yeah. So most of the time they're asymptomatic. The doctor is not aware of it. The patient is not aware of it. Okay. Sometimes when they're symptomatic, I would say they're minimally symptomatic, meaning a touch of a headache and a touch of dizziness and a touch of confusion. Uh, but that would be it. Uh, and most of the time does not need to go to the hospital, doesn't need the steroids, doesn't need spinal tap, all the things we get excited about for basic swelling in the brain, you know, because it sounds scary. You know, if I yeah. just said brain swelling, that sounds scary. But the fact is, is that it's uh, most of the time nobody's even aware of it. it's occurring. Okay. Have you heard of anybody getting worse on aducatumab? I'm sure somebody must have, but I mean, is that... I don't know that because most of the data is on research study, uh, it's in trials. Okay. 
Fair enough. And, but yeah. I will say to you, Nate, that we've done other drugs that have patients gotten worse. I mean, I've seen it twice in my career where we give them a study drug and they actually got worse on it. So you cannot say it's not, it can't happen. So this is so interesting. So I, and I want to be respectful of your time here. So, so you mentioned past trials, you mentioned other drugs in sort of the same family or working in somewhat the same way as this new medicine. Um, do you have where, in other words, where there's been an attempt to remove the toxic proteins of amyloid, and then, um, and in often cases, you know, when you're following people, they, they had an extra amount. You're not using people that don't have excess amyloid, like we used to do, apparently, at least in research. And then, you know, so now we're qualified, you know, we have some good tests to, to demonstrate that they have that. Then you're giving the medicines, and then you can see that amyloid's removed, but a lot of people don't improve. Do you have any intuition as to why that might be? Yeah, because they think that amyloid has nothing to do with the disease. And uh, I would say to you that come and live in my world and we'll talk about it. Uh, it's very nuanced. Amyloid okay. is very important. So uh, to be clear, amyloid accumulation occurs mostly in the pre-symptomatic phase and does not correlate with clinical progression. But if to say it's not relevant is, is a person who's not really kind of deep in the weeds here. So when you're deep in the weeds, you know that there's the Alzheimer's disease is a biphasic disease. It's the pre-symptomatic amyloid driven phase. And then the symptomatic tau tangles, uh, excitotoxicity, neurochemical breakdown. So other things correlate like synapse loss much, much better in clinical symptoms and clinical progression than amyloid does. But actually, amyloid does not correlate well. But to say it has nothing to do with disease shows that it's not true. It actually is a driver of all this pathology. It causes damage to the brain. The accumulation of amyloid, and particularly a specific species of amyloid called an oligomeric species, damages the brain cells, the synapses, the environment. It, it activates the inflammatory mechanisms called microglial activation. In other words, the brain starts to go, oh my goodness, this protein should not be here. Let's scavenge it and try to pull it out of the brain. So. It's a very dynamic thing. It's much more dynamic than people thought. It's not a slow accumulation. It's actually a dynamic uh, uh, condition. So uh, to say that Amelie has nothing to do with the Alzheimer's is somebody who's not deep in the weeds. Got it. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to give you, uh, you know, just a, a couple of last questions if we have time. Sure. I, I want to give you a chance to um, respond uh, to, in effort to really try to help the public make their own decision, right? Everybody gets to make their own decision in this country still, uh, for the most part. And, and you know, like somebody, like people are coming to you, people are coming to uh, me, you know, all of our colleagues, you know, people are coming to and saying, should I take this medication? I don't understand. I read this in the New York Times. I read this in the Washington Post. I read this in my local newspaper. I saw this on the news. Three of the uh, eleven uh, members of the FDA's sort of independent advisory panel, so they're. Apparently, you know, so they're they're not uh, working for the FDA. Uh, for the most part, they're not working for any of the, the companies involved in the in the study, and they resigned. And you know, you can just go online and, and read all the sort of scathing uh, comments that they've made. You know, it's this worst decision in FDA history. Like, how do you, how do you respond to those people? I respond to those people by saying, you know, I have been in this field a long time. Uh, and we need to realize that it's not a panacea. The data is modest, uh, but there are a group of people that benefit. And to to deny that uh, is just not taking the totality of data in mind. Uh, and I think, you know, the question is a risk-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. I also want to point out to you that we need this drug to kind of fuel the machine that could lead to better drugs down the road. I remind this audience that uh, it was not, at, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin are the seventh and eighth statins. It was well, not, you know we one. think of those as cholesterol medicines for heart right. disease things. Like right. That. We don't. People don't even remember the first one, like right. Baycol and Mevacor. Nobody uses those drugs anymore. Right. No, because the better drugs came down the road. And if you, my point is, is that monoclonal antibodies may get better. So each one is better than the previous one. But to say that there is none and to criticize the data and say there's no signal is is not true. The totality of the evidence is, number one, the class is showing a clinical effect. Two, they all remove drug, remove amyloid hugely. If you actually look at aducanumab, donanumab, gantanerumab, 
and lecanemab, they remove amyloid almost to zero. And uh, so the question you're trying to decide is, is removal of amyloid a clinically associated with a clinically meaningful change? That's the question you should be asking, not whether the drug works or not. It wipes amyloid clean out of the brain. I can tell you that. You can actually look at the scans. Yeah. So we know we can do this. We can do this very, very well. Lecanemab, gantanerumab, donanumab, aducanumab. Remove it as if it's not in the brain anymore. That's a huge success. We now have a targeted biological drug that targets the specific disease. The question are, is it, is it too late? Are we treating patients because they should be getting this drug before the onset of symptoms? And B, is amyloid have anything to do with the disease process? And these are the questions that should be asked. Okay. Uh, but, uh, I, so, so the controversy, I say, uh, really, really got to see the nuances here. The second thing is, is now the totality of evidence suggests that there is some slowing in the decline when you give this class of drugs. Not huge, but some. Uh, and actually, if you look at prime, if you actually look at the data of aducanemab in aggregate, meaning prime plus engage plus emerge. So these are the different trials. Or these these are the different trials. Yeah. It's positive, by the way. It's positive. The I'm high, the high, true, high uh, uh, dose group compared to placebo clearly slows the rate of decline. Like I said, wipes out amyloid to near zero in the brain. So you can't, you know, we can nitpick, we can split it, we can split hairs, we can disagree, well, one's positive, one's negative. We can do all that, but if you look at the data in aggregate, A, multiple uh, monoclonals showing the same thing, B, that the data in aggregate shows a, an effect, C, there's a huge unmet demand, uh, and D, uh, my, this class of drugs now seems to be uh, uh, on target. I think you can make the argument that it, it is a good idea. Excellent. And I, I saw you say something I thought was pretty clever. It was, I think it was written, I can't remember if I saw it or watched okay. it or whatever, where you said in order to have, you know, I think you were of the opinion and in the camp that probably like chemotherapy, HIV, heart disease, where you use multiple medications, uh, Alzheimer's will be no different in the future from a medication standpoint. Um, but in order to have the fourth and fifth drug, you have to have the first drug. I think right. something 100%. like that. Or, 100%. The future of Alzheimer's is chemotherapy. It's not going to be a one drug target. It's going to be a five drug target. And ironically, people are not even realizing that we're already doing that. Okay. If you look at a drug like, uh, if you look at the clinical trial of aducanumab and Gage and Emerge, you were allowed to take Aricept and Nemenda on top, uh, in the background. So there is no true placebo. It's ADU plus standard of care versus standard of care plus placebo. Do you see my point? Yeah. So these patients never were on nothing. Yeah. In fact, we haven't done a tr clinical trial on nothing versus study drug in decades. Okay. Yeah. There was a decision made very early on 20 years ago, just like stroke trials, you could never do a stroke trial that ha doesn't at least have aspirin as the comparator. There's yeah. considered unethical to give a stroke yeah. trial where you have no, no, the placebo group, placebo group yeah. is has nothing. There is no that's that's unethical. That's a re ethically rendered. Same thing with our Alzheimer drugs. It is very unheard of nowadays to do a trial where you have no where the placebo is really, really a placebo and there's nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent point that a lot of people probably don't know. Any other promising drugs coming up that you're sort of optimistic about? Ben, yeah. You mentioned lecanemab a couple of times. And yeah. So we talked about the whole class. I think that the other drugs, lecanemab, gantanerumab, donanumab, have very, very good data. And uh, I think that the door has been opened for a better pathway with those drugs, which may or may not, but possibly may have even better data than the aducanumab data. So we'll wait and see on that. Any sense uh, of the timeline on that? Uh, yeah. So we're looking at one approval per year. I think Gant could be approved by the end of 22, lecanemab end of 23, and donanumab by the end of 24. And then you have other drugs kind of up, rising up through the ranks. The Cortexine Core 388, Athera's ATH 1017, Alzion's ALZ 801, uh, and of course other drugs. So this, the field is booming. There are over 75 drugs in dr trials for Alzheimer's disease. To say there's nothing going on is 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 groundbreak. It is really not tr consistent with the reality. I heard it, Nate. I heard an interesting statistic that you will very find very interesting. 
Yeah. For the drug approved, aducanumab, how much was spent in investment by the pharmaceutical industries to see this first drug approved in 20 years? Do you want to guess? So by the pharmaceutical industry in general or just aducanumab? No, in general, across the board. Oh, billions? Forty billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And one hundred and seventy-six thousand patients in trials to yeah. see this one drug approved. So to say, this is you know we're kind of we're kind of barely scratching over the finish line, but uh, I think we need this win. We really, really need this win. I have to tell you, you the thing you see in patients when they have mild cognitive impairment, you look in their eyes. Nate, and they have fear. Like oh, I know. Fear. Suicide. I've had two patients where they're suicidal. You know, they're... Yeah. You know, there's... Fear. They, uh, and they're they panicked oh, because yeah. they know where this is going. All yeah. of them. Yeah. And I I do everything I can to say we're going to get through this. But any tool in my toolbox that's better than the status quo, I'm going for it. I'm pro-treatment. Yeah. I'm Yes, I'm pro aducanumab, but I'm pro-treatment. And if, if the next drug is better than this, I'll go to the next drug. And if we need to use five drugs at the same time. We're going to do that. And I know we're kind of way past our time, but yeah. I want to make a two points. This is a transformative moment in the field, Nate. This is the transformative moment. We're, uh, we're now taking Alzheimer's disease from a terminal disease, as everybody knows this, to a chronic disease. Okay. Right. This is the diabetes and HIV of our time. This is the drug. This is the disease that we're going to transform. I mean, people, I remember I was in college when HIV, HIV was then, it was a death, death, death sentence. sentence. Absolutely. You were dead. Okay. Yep. Now people, I mean, it's not great, but people live decades with HIV because the drugs are that good. Diabetes, I remember in medical school, you are going to be blind, amputated, and on dialysis. I remember, you remember yeah. that, Nate. And yeah, and our parents remember when heart disease was like that, right? Yeah, people were, right. Everybody, right. Every, all the men were dying in their 50s from heart disease, right? Right. 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 So I see that uh, Alzheimer's disease will become a chronic disease, hopefully now sooner than I, uh, than I thought. And that's a wonderful thing, right? Yeah. One day you'll have a little forgetfulness. We'll do a blood test, spinal tap scan. Oh, you have some amyloid in your brain. We'll put you on drug aducanumab or some successor to aducanumab. And Alzheimer's disease will go from a terminal disease to an annoying disease, but not a life-threatening one. Okay. So this is exciting times. Why not uh, combine uh, aducanumab in a trial with um, lifestyle, intensive lifestyle uh, intervention, right? That so it's never been done in a design, but the implied expectation is that you wouldn't do lifestyle or aducanumab. Yeah. You should be doing both, right? Oh. You should be taking your denepazil. You should be exercising like a fiend, because the data on mild cognitive impairment and exercise is better than aducanumab, by the way. Yep, uh, that's a great. But point. it's not one to the exclusion of the other, right? No. Eat no. right, diet, sleep, improve your sleep. Uh, uh, optimize your blood pressure. Everything should be done because we know that all of them work probably in uh, in aggregate. They work yeah. together, and I think that's where the field is going to go. It's very exciting. Last thing, I promise this should be the last thing. Uh, <laughs> just getting practical for a second, because you know, like we like you've mentioned, we mentioned like everybody's got patients calling. You're having conversations in your office. Um, how are people going to get access? Like, do, do you have is the is there a sense of how people are like? Who do they call? How yeah. do they, you know, what, what's the time frame on it? Yeah. You know? So, yeah. So there's a lot of things to say here, Nate. Um, one that people don't understand is that we in the field, all of us, you and me included, are not ready for this disease, this drug. Right. We're just not. Nope. And I realized that this week. I'm at the Cleveland Clinic. I thought we were in the vanguard here, and we are not flipping ready for this drug. Okay? Well, yeah. What do I mean by that? We have patients who are clinically described. Most patients go get a diagnosis, but they don't have any biomarker confirmation that they have amyloid. Yes. So exactly. we have a whole, we have thousands, tens of thousands, possibly millions of patients who might be eligible, but we don't have any idea if they have amyloid in their brain. And if you think that's an, a, a foregone conclusion, please don't assume that. It turns out if you look at mild cognitive impairment, only 50% of them have amyloid in their brain and 50% don't. And in Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's dementia, only 75% have amyloid in the brain, 25% don't. So we're actually misdiagnosing. It's with that, the take-home me message here is that we're, we're misdiagnosing people with a disease that they actually don't have. 
-hmm. They may have something else. They may have dementia, but not Alzheimer's dementia. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we need to biomarker. First major hurdle we're going to face is that we have to now go back and biomarker confirm all those thousands of patients, millions of patients. Second thing is, is we know we're going to. It's going to be complicated to get these patients into. You need MRIs. You need safety protocol checklists. You got to get them into the infusion chair. You need to make sure that they're going to be scheduled every month. Third is there's going to be a titration schedule. So it's not like suddenly you're going to get 10 milligrams per kilogram, which is the top dose. Right. You've got to get there, right? So it's going to be two or three months of one milligram per kilogram, two or three months of three milligrams per kilogram, two or three months of six milligrams per kilogram, and then 10 milligrams. So it'll take almost a year, it's like eight to 12 months to get you to the dose. That's for the, so that people will get the uh, safety. That's all for safety purposes. So there's a lot of complications and no, the field's not ready. Yeah, so we'll learn. We've got to learn faster, right? Oh, yeah. This is where kind of, this is all of us, all of us, you, me, we're all being thrown in the deep end and we're going to learn how to swim. Even though we've been doing this for a living, we've got to learn how to do this uh, uh, right away. Well, we really appreciate your time, your expertise, and, and really it's rare to, to meet someone with, with this kind of track record and experience to speak Thank to these issues. I really appreciate your spending time with us. Of course, you will. So that's our episode. I hope it was useful to you. Check out the show notes on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comments section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. If you have questions or comments, connect with us on social media. Finally, to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. Thanks. We'll talk to you next time.